students. Uh, we all came back together. They provided me their notes, and then that's what I used as the basis for writing this report. Uh, the report gave a lot of do's and don'ts. It was not a plan in the sense that it assigned responsibility to certain individuals or entities to do certain acts or that it prioritized work like other plans would do, the kind of plan that you would think of. Rather, this was a lot of here are some things you ought to do, here are some things you shouldn't do, and here are some things you've got to be very cautious about. And that's what we provided to the Pentagon. Uh, the organization I was with, the Institute for National Security Studies, was a think tank for both the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, so this was typically the kind of thing that we would do. So you end up, fast, fast forwarding here again, you end up being essentially a liaison between U.S. reconstruction efforts and the Iraqi military. In that capacity, tell me what you did. Well, that was an interesting event. Um, I was in the Republican Palace in Baghdad handling some daily issues when a battalion commander from the 101st uh, Airborne comes in and he goes, Colonel, I need to talk to somebody. I've got a bunch of Iraqi generals and colonels that want to meet with somebody from ORHA, the Office of Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance. Uh, and at that point in time, we had nobody from the Pentagon in Baghdad with us serving as the liaison to what had been the Iraqi military. So it fell on me to go meet with these fellows. Uh, and so I went out into uh, certain parts of Baghdad to meet with these generals and colonels and over the course of several meetings hammered out uh, a procedure whereby they were going to provide me a great deal of information about soldiers and units and equipment and ammo depots and things of that nature. Uh, and in return, we would provide them a $20 payment. Um, one of the things that comes through very clearly, um, speaking of your role in Iraq, is that the role of Mr. Bremer, who, in, who in L. Paul Bremer, who at the time was in charge, uh, over there, for whatever that means. One of the things that's clear watching, watching the documentary is that he got a number of things wrong, some key things he got wrong. But I'm, I'm curious in hindsight how it is that we now see that Bremer miscalculated on so many different fronts. At least that's the take one gets from the documentary. Well, uh, certainly that's what you get from the documentary. I can only speak to the one that revolved around the uh, disbanding of the Iraqi military. In our time in Washington, D.C. with Jay Garner, before we departed for the theater, we had talked about what we would do with the Iraqi military. We understood that they were large. We understood that these men knew how to use weapons. We understood that there were a lot of weapons and ammo dumps across the country. And so the intent for us was to get in there, make contact with the Ministry of Defense, and then organize a process where we could pay these men $20 each, uh, that was the equivalent of about six months of pay, so that they could take care of their families and hopefully stay off the streets long enough for us to sort out what the military was going to be doing. We had two processes that we were putting into play. One was to reform these units as work battalions to help clean up rubble and things of that nature. And the second one was to establish what we call DDR which is disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. It's a process by which you take former combatants and reintegrate them into society so that they become productive members of the economy. Uh, this all had been briefed to the president. The president approved it before we left Washington. But then when we got out there and when Bremer showed up, suddenly there was this snap decision made by these four men in the Pentagon, as the movie portrays, um, and uh, you know the history, the army and, was disbanded. And, the, and, the, and the, the, the result of that, that you obviously are chagrined by, for lack of a better word, is what, essentially? Well, five days after the decision was announced, uh, we took our first attack on the highway out between the, what, was, what most people call the Green Zone mm -hmm. and Baghdad International Airport. Two soldiers were killed and two Humvees were destroyed. It was the night before Jay Garner was to depart Iraq forever. Um, and this came about, without a doubt, as a result of the disbanding of the Iraqi military. You, um, I'm fast forwarding again in the time I have left here right quick, you went on to do some work uh, with the Iraq study group. Um, and I'm curious now, given the work you have done all the way through this process um, and where we are now, um, 
there, there has to be an end in sight at some point. There's got to be a way out of this. I don't, I don't, I don't propose to know it, and um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know who does. Obviously, the White House doesn't. Uh, but ultimately, what is going to happen here? What should happen here? How do we get out of here? Or does this thing go on, you know, ad infinitum? Well, Tavis, you don't fight a war just to fight a war. You have to do it in pursuit of your national interests. And what I'm recommending to people right now is that you've got to take a step back and put Iraq in perspective uh, with the rest of this, what people refer to as this global war on terrorism, which I'm not very comfortable with as a term. But Iraq is one campaign in a much larger war, you know, and we've got to understand how this fits together. Additionally, we have to take a look at what are the U.S. interests in the Persian Gulf, identify those interests, and do what's necessary then to protect and to serve those interests. You know, things like stabilizing the region, uh, stopping Iran from becoming uh, a dominant power, and maintaining the access for the world market, the world economy, to the oil that's out there. But these require the U.S. to bring a lot more things to bear than just the military. You've got to bring in the, your diplomacy. You've got to bring in your public information. You've got to bring in your economic power to make all this come together. This administration, though, has only focused on using its military, well, or military might to the exclusion of everything else. Mm. Colonel Paul Hughes can be seen. It really is the emotional part um, uh, of this uh, new documentary, No End in Sight. Colonel Hughes, nice to have you on the program. All the best to you. My pleasure. Thank you.